At this point, let's take a quick overview of the RZT-1 and find out what some of its key features are that's going to help us in for our motion control. Um, first, it has an ARM Cortex R4F CPU with tightly coupled memory. And this, what this does is it allows us to access this RAM very, very quickly and it really helps enhance real-time performance. It's got a single double precision floating point uh, processor on there. Uh, the other thing it has is a uh, Renesas RN engine, which is actually a separate processor that's, uh, that is used to support uh, industry protocols such as EtherCAT, ProfNet, Ethernet, IF, Modbus, TCP, and, and other things. And it also allows us to do embedded encoder interface. The system leverages a real-time CPU core with nested interrupt vector controller um, and allows us cacheless operation with its tightly coupled memory. So right up top here is a port for the encoder and adjacent to it is uh, another additional port for any further uh, motors you decide to connect. Uh, if you come around to the left side you've got eight digital uh, inputs which are all 24 volt tolerant and next to them is another two digital inputs also 24 volt tolerant. Right here you've got a six input uh, hall sensor for any additional sensor inputs. And right here is a, an eight position dip switch next to the eight user defined LEDs. Right here you've got two UART uh, ICS connections. And above there is the JTAG interface uh, connection. If you come around to the right side of those, you've got a four channel Delta Sigma interface. This set of connections are the inverter interface analog feedback connections. Right over here you've got EtherCAT RJ45 connectors for any uh, EtherCAT uh, controllers you have. Right here are those EtherCAT LEDs and another, uh, another inverter interface right there. Right up here is the RS-232, RS-422 CAN bus and adjacent to it is your standard USB device. Here you can see is the RZT1 SOC itself and next to it is 32 megabytes of flash storage. Uh, the connector here is used for connecting the logic power and the motor power and we can wire our own cables up to make this possible. Alright, now the ca cable has been assembled. We've labeled this cable a little sloppy but uh, the plus and minus for the logic are on the left, the plus and minus for the motor are on the right. Uh, it's worth noting here the logic value, the logic voltage is between 12 and 24 volts. Not 5 volts, not 3 volts, like you might be tempted to do. The motor voltage can go up to 48 volts. You can actually run the same voltage into both if you're just trying to spin the motor. If you're going to do something more aggressive with your motor, try and drive loads, really push on it, you're going to need not just a separate voltage supply, but a, a good 4 quadrant voltage supply that will give you um, all the uh, characteristics that you need to, to drive that motor well. In our case, we'll just do two separate ones. Now, showing on here, it's worth noting as well, uh, the board's designed in such a way that the voltages are isolated uh, from each other, logic's isolated, and you can see the high voltage comes in here, and you've got a fuse that's on the board, but you got a fuse, so if something goes horribly wrong, you still got a shot of not blowing up the entire board, and then it's isolated here. The logic comes in here, there's a five volt un uh, unisolated uh, signal that comes in, and then there's also a three volt isolated for your logic. All right, we've now connected our, our development kit to the power supply. What we've done here is I have the left, this supply at 12 volts for logic. The middle supply will be our motor supply. And we have our current limit at half an amp for the logic. And an amp, this particular power supply puts out an amp. We're not gonna push it, so it's, it's gonna be fine. So once we've done that, we'll turn on our power and you'll see our lights come on and start flashing um, back in here. You can see the lights on the power board coming on telling us that all our voltage rails are good. So here we have the connector we wired up for powering the devices. That gets plugged in right here to port 4 and port 5. Your motor windings cable can get plugged in right over here to port 3. And you go ahead and plug the, uh, the encoder cable in right here on port 1. The last cable to plug in would be the serial cable um, that is used for communicating between the software and the board itself. Okay, now that we've powered on our controller, it's time to run the software. It looks like this. Let's take a quick look at the main, the main page. Um, this allows us to configure the motor parameters, such as the number of poles, the number of encoder counts per revolution, all that good stuff. Um, there's also uh, settings for the type of encoder that you have back, if, whether it's incremental or differential, absolute, all that good stuff. The motor commutation co configuration is also there, and it's help for, helpful for setting when we have motor wire winding mappings 
uh, for the different amplifiers, and, and it lets us experiment. If something doesn't get set up right, you can, you can still move stuff around there. Uh, so those are all sitting down here. All right, so let's, uh, let's actually connect to the board. The very first step that we, we take is to hit this connect button. When we do that, we get a uh, serial port button, uh, serial port dialog that comes up. Mine happens to be connected to COM6. At least I believe it is, we'll find out here in a second. And if it is connected, it will show up like this. Now, just, for, just so you can see, this is what it looks like if you don't get this right. If you, if you have it set up or you're not connected, and you hit OK, you'll get a, uh, you'll get a message uh, dialog like that. Or if we're not even connected, and you try and connect, and we go on to COM6 here, we hit OK, it sits and says it failed to connect. So there's, there's usually pretty good feedback telling us what's going on, whether it's working or not. Uh, barring seeing any kind of those, those messages, if you click it, and it comes up like that, it should be good. Your other indication here is your Hall effect sensors are, are now being shown. So at this point, what we can do is we can check to make sure that the motor uh, uh, Hall effect sensors and the, the encoder is set up right. So if we, if we turn our shaft, you can see that my Hall sensors change. And you can also see that the position is changing. So at this point, we believe that we have gotten set up and with no power, everything looks good. Now that we know that the motor's configured right, let's make it move. We're going to do this in an open loop configuration first, just to make sure that we can run it, just like you might a, a, a brush DC motor. What we're going to do is come down here to commands, and we're going to click on the power on button. Now you'll notice a couple things as it shows power off now, but you can also see that the, the corresponding LED went out, showing that the power is now on. It's not an air condition. If I, if I unclick it, you can see that that light comes on and off. All right, now in, in, uh, in order to actually make it move, we're gonna click on the motion uh, tab up at the top and here at the very bottom is where we can do our open loop control. We can put in a percentage for of our voltage and we can just click the buttons just like you would jog a, a motor if you were doing this manually. So if I click and hold the uh, forward button, you can see that we are jogging the motor forward at 5% voltage. If I click the reverse, you can see that we're going backwards. You can also see here that the hall sensors in position is, is also updating real time, which is kind of nice. Uh, at this point, we can increase our voltage percentage. I'll jump him up to 20%, and you can see now he's spinning a little bit faster forward and backward. So at this point, we're pretty confident that we're working in an open loop control method. Now that we've run an open loop, let's go ahead and close the control loop by clicking on the servo on button here at the bottom left. Now, one quick check that we can do to know that this has happened is if we reach over here and try and turn the, the shaft, what we're gonna find is that there's, there's resistance to that. When we're in open servo or if the power is on, we can turn that shaft freely. Now we can't. Now to test uh, the, the closed loop, we are going to come here to the motion generator portion of the motion tab, and we're gonna set a couple uh, parameters here. Now, this takes into account the position setting of the encoder. So what you wanna do is you wanna come here and clear him first. Otherwise, if you're outside, you might start running a direction and never see this thing reach its end point. Uh, so we set the, pos the current position to zero, and we're going to do a target, an absolute target of 1,000. And if I, all I have to do to initiate a motion is click this button right here, and you'll see a thousand turns into quarter turn because that is uh, 4,000 counts per turn. Now, if I click this again, nothing's gonna happen. We wouldn't expect anything to happen because we're already there. If we wanna move back to position one, we can click the go to one button right here. Now, that's sometimes interesting, but we wanna do more. So let's just go ahead and bump him up to 10,000. And now you see that if I, if I press go to two, he's gonna spin several quarter turns. Um, now I can go right back to position one. All right, now that we have our motor moving in a, in a motion profile, let's visually look at what's happening here. We can do that by pressing the view button up here and we're gonna enable the motion scope. Now what the motion scope lets us do is graph various parameters of our motion on this graph here. So there's four different ch uh, channels that we can show. Each channel can hold something different. Uh, in this case, we can do the left, right motors, we can choose a scale and then we can choose what we're gonna graph. So in this case, let's enable channel one and we're gonna look at its velocity. Yeah, you could look at whatever you wanted to, but we'll, we'll just look at his velocity on this one and you'll see that 
Uh, as we look at this, we see the trapezoidal velocity, the acceleration coming to speed, the, main, the maintain, maintenance of that speed, and then the deceleration to get to our desired position. Uh, on channel two, let's look at position error. This shows us the error in time as we're accelerating, as we're maintaining, and as we're decelerating. So you can see we lose our position, or we have error here, and then we make it up here. Got a little bit of oscillating going on here while we're maintaining position. And then as we decelerate, you can see that we get error in there, as we'd expect, and then it all comes to a nice end at this point right here. Now that we've got a visualization of our motion, we can start to play with our acceleration and deceleration parameters a little bit and see if we can get the expected results. So now if I come here to acceleration, and let's say I'm going to increase him by a magnitude. I click him on there, and you'll see that now he's coming to speed very quickly. That got much more uh, steep, which is what we'd expect. Uh, similarly, if I take my deceleration and half that, we'd expect him to take twice as long to come down. And that's exactly what, that, what happens. Now this is interesting because we see that he starts to decelerate, but he gets to position before he's fully decelerated. And you can see that the, the algorithm handles that situation just fine. All right, now that we've uh, been able to change our decelerations and accelerations velocities, and we see that those are, are represented in our visualization, Let's look at the positional error, which is shown here in green. And we can see that we've got a little bit of oscillating going on here during our constant velocity. And, and it, it bumps a little bit on the acceleration and deceleration too. So let's do something about that. Uh, fortunately, this tool allows us to tune our PID coefficients by clicking on the tuning uh, tab right here. And we can access the, the uh, coefficients right here. So let's just come in here and, and fiddle with these a little bit. I'm going to take the 250 and let's just bounce it down to 25. Oh, once we've done that, we see that, uh, that we've got quite a bit more oscillating going on here. And uh, that's not what we want. If you look at our little uh, HWI label, you can see that he's bouncing at the end too, which is kind of designated by this. It's just not finding its position right. So that certainly wasn't good. Let's just keep, uh, let's look at the integral, which is gonna be our stability. We'll change him down a magnitude as well. Let's see what happens when we do that. Huh, that looks pretty good actually. Um, we come here, we see we've got fairly smooth uh, error here. It comes up once we go, and yeah, we still have, we got a little bit of overshoot here, and we've got a little bit of oscillation. But uh, as we look at the label there, it looks like it's coming to a stop fairly nicely. You can see that it, it, it overshoots and comes back a little bit. You can see that if you look carefully at the, uh, at the actual uh, video. And that's represented by this. So the nice part of this is that it does let us see in two ways what's going on. And you can imagine that if we had some more time, we could continue to, to, to play with those uh, parameters until we get exactly the motion that we're looking for.